Um, appreciate everyone taking time with their busy schedule to hop on. So excited you are attending our free parent webinar through Guiding Bright Minds called The Twice Exceptional Child, How Cognitive Functioning and Learning Impacts Social, Emotional, and Behavioral Development. I am so excited to introduce our two panelists today, but let me tell you a little bit about me and Guiding Bright Minds. I'm Tiffany Feingold, co-founder of Guiding Bright Minds. Um, and through personal experience and personal journey, my husband and I launched this organization about 15 months ago. And um, my husband grew up with undiagnosed ADHD and dyslexia. So as a child in the 80s, he knew um, and felt all of those struggles. And um, his parents were able to find some great resources that helped him um, thrive and succeed. Otherwise, you know, he would tell you today, he probably wouldn't have even finished high school. Um, it was so, you know, traumatic for him and that experience and being misunderstood. Um, and then we have amazing boy who um, is also um, ADHD and, and early on we felt the impact and how overwhelming it was for him in just his early years of school and what that experience looked like. And so knowing some wonderful professionals out there and just the experience my husband went through and and he started an organization also results learning that does academic coaching that helps kids with executive functioning. Um, and we decided we wanted to help parents on their journey. And so when we launched Guiding Bright Minds, we wanted to create a community that brought all of the professionals, educators, parents together and how we can really collaborate to stop the stigmas and stereotypes and to provide and surround our children with the support that they need to be successful to be understood, um, to see what some of those differences are and how we can accommodate them and really work on changing what that looks like and what that landscape and really be transformational to them. So if you haven't checked out our website, please go to Guiding Bright Minds. You can join for free as a parent, as a caregiver, um, and get the resources. Our free webinars, which we offer to a month, is just one way we want to help you on your journey. But we also want to provide guidance, direction. And one of the key aspects of that success and helping is introducing you to providers like Craig and like Rosalie, who are dedicated to helping our neurodiverse communities community who have spent their life really finding ways in which we can improve and create that focus on the superpowers, on those amazing strengths while also addressing their needs. So we do want to hear from you in the chat. Um, I will put a link to our website, a link to join us. You can get our newsletters as well. We put events on there. I host a monthly Zoom call for parents so you can get together and meet other people who understand what that journey's like. That's been life-changing for me. I love my, my friends who don't have, or who have neurotypical kids, but the ones that have neurodiverse kids that really understand that have been so profound. So we want to support you as best as we can. So please look at our website. There's also a place where you can add um, comments questions, um, if you need specific help and guidance on your journey of what those next steps are, please go to our website and reach out to me and we will work on what that looks like and how we can help you with the next steps. So thank you all so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Let me tell you about Craig Nippenberg. He's the therapist and founder of Colorado's largest private mental health practice specializing in child and adolescent neurobehavioral disorders. He is the author of Wired and Connected, a brain-based solutions to ensure your child's social and emotional success, which is based on 25 years of brain-based curriculum developed at St. Anne's Episcopal School in Denver, Colorado. During the early months of COVID, he presented a phased approach to navigating COVID-19 for families through Facebook Live. He's currently the host of the podcast, Legit Parenting Strategies for Actual Imperfect, in parentheses, Parents for Building Resilient Children and Families. The podcast is available on Apple and Spotify. So Craig, thank you so much for being here thank today. Thank you, Tiffany. Yes, I appreciate that. Rosalie has worked with children with disabilities since the age of 12. She's a longtime equestrian with began her journey helping children 
using equine therapy, Rosalie founded or focused on the journey helping children using equine therapy. She focused on the journey when she used or obtained a degree in interdisciplinary studies from the University of Northern Colorado, concentrating on art, human rehabilitation services, special education, and psychology. In 2009, she graduated from Nova Southwestern University with a master's degree in counseling and advanced behavior analysis and became a board certified behavior analyst. She strives to enhance and lives to enhance, sorry, the lives of all the individuals she works with through increasing their access to meaningful participation in all areas of their lives. So, so wonderful to have you today, Rosalie. I am going to have Rosalie kick it off and get started. So over to you. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for introducing me. And I'm so excited to, to be here to um, talk with families, providers, um, and also just, just uh, learn more about Craig and, and what um, his practice has to offer as well. Um, so I am going to kick us off with a quick shared purpose matrix. Um, and today our, our kind of topic is this twice exceptional child, right? How that high cognitive functioning and learning impact our social and emotional and behavioral development and really kind of our access to the world around us. Um, so I am gonna start off down here and please feel free. I am going to make sure I can see the chat because I would love if people um, chime in if you feel comfortable and if you don't, don't worry at all. And Tiffany and Craig, please do chime in. So the first question that I'm gonna ask everybody today is who or what is important to you in our shared purpose? And I will say our two e-learners, and I'm gonna say parents, I'm gonna say teachers, professionals. Another huge piece I think too is funding sources. I feel like these two e-learners are misunderstood by funding sources frequently. Uh, Craig or Tiffany, do you guys have anything to add and who or what is important to us today? That covers it. Okay, yeah. awesome. Now in our kind of next squadron over here, we've got what yucky stuff shows up and gets in the way, which is stuff kind of inside of us, our mental experiencing, our thinking, things with inside us. And I will start us off and say confusion. When we are working with 2E learners, I think there's a lot of confusion that show up. I think a lot of fear shows up sometimes too. And a lot of rules, right? Like you can do this, but wait a second. What's happening? You can't. What is going on here? Um, Tiffany or Craig, any yucky stuff that shows up for you when we're talking about two e-learners? Well, I, I think for myself as a parent of one or two, um, parental anxiety and oh. frustration. <laughs> yes. Ooh, and I got frustration in the chat too, for sure. Oh, and I forgot to warn people, I'm not a very good seller. So um, you guys will see some red lines on there. I'm actually dyslexic myself and an adhd -er, So you'll hear me kind of bouncing all over the place as well. But yeah, for sure, anxiety, frustration. Um, I think uh, all of those things show up frequently when we're working with this 2E population or parenting that 2E population. So then I'm gonna kind of jump up to our next quadrant and I'm gonna ask everybody, what behaviors will I see or hear you using to get relief from that yucky stuff that shows up? And relief for me sometimes looks like overproducing material. If I produce one more worksheet, one more, one more checklist to help you with your executive functioning, we're gonna get there. I'm gonna get some relief from that kind of anxiety that shows up. Uh, you might also see me having some adult beverages. <laughs> right, to get some relief from that yucky stuff that shows up 
when we're talking about that fear, that anxiety, those kind of rules of, man, you should be able to do this with all of your skills. You've got this. Um, other things you might see me doing to get some relief are maybe arguing to the death. You can do this. I know you can do it. You've got it. All of those types of things. What about you guys, Tiffany and Craig? You guys got any behaviors that I would see or hear you using to get relief from that yucky stuff that shows up? Oh. I'm going to add another one. Yoga. Yeah. I've yeah. Been meditation definitely getting involved and, and by walks and, and exercise. I've been totally relief moves can be helpful or not helpful. So that's why I threw my adult beverages in there. Depends on what's helpful or not helpful to you. All right. So oh, bargaining. Yes. Uh, bargaining for sure. Um, and exercise. Awesome. All right. So if we move over to our kind of last quadrant over there, which is what behaviors will I see or hear you using to move towards what's important to us today in our conversation? And I think something that you'll see me doing a lot of is talking, talking about twice exceptional individuals. Um, you're also going to see me doing a lot of kind of cross-referencing, like I'm going to go outside of my field, which is behavior analysis, and I'm going to talk to other professionals like Craig. I, I want this well-rounded approach, so I'm going to talk to others, and I'm going to be willing to try things that are different. You never know what's going to work. Um, Anybody else, what behaviors would I see or hear you using to move towards what's important to us? All right. I, I personally find taking notes and then I make sticky notes of things to remind myself when I'm at home with my, my teenage daughter of what I'm trying to focus on versus getting upset. Yes. I love sticky notes. I feel like those are like one of the most helpful, ooh, questioning motives or questioning, poten ooh, potential ableism, totally. Yeah, if we don't kind of question, I think it's challenging, right? But, and especially that potential ableism, those are wonderful ones. Yeah. It's so important to kind of look at things from a willingness as well as like questioning, like where are we um, and, and how are we moving forward? There we go. All right, so that was a quick loop around the matrix. Sometimes they take a lot longer, but we don't have much time today. So I'm just gonna ask us as a group if we're gonna have a chance to notice all of this stuff showing up as we kind of walk through our conversation. And I know I for sure will. All right. So if we kind of get started, I look at twice exceptional learners in this kind of dichotomous way, because it's just, it's amazing how easy it is for some things and how hard it is for others, right? So it's like, I'm so bright, it's so easy for me to learn, but it's easy for my mistakes and imperfections too. Like, whoa, they can derail me in a heartbeat. Um, I can be hyper-focused on something and totally into it, but then super easily distracted. I can be highly motivated, but not motivated at all, right? I'm, I'm in it, I'm learning, or I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hanging out on my video games. Um, I have things that are really important to me, but, but sometimes those interests kind of are different and they can be different from day to day. It's not consistent. Um, I follow directions in one subject, but then I totally ignore my teacher in another subject. Um, I persist and then I have zero tolerance, right? Some days I can do so many things and then other days, please don't ask me to even think about that. I have all A's, but then I also have F's on my report card. Um, I look like I'm unstoppable, uh, but then I'm totally defeated by losing my pencil or something so small, like 
my, my little hair wisps are falling into my face, totally defeated. Um, I can be super organized, but then I can't find that one little thing that I really need to make my day work for me. Um, I can totally plan something, but then I can't even get started on it. Like I've got this elaborate plan. It's amazing. It's incredible. But then I, I can't even get started with it. It's so overwhelming. I can tolerate emotions around my preferred interests. I can, uh, I can hold those emotions, I can carry them. Uh, but then I've got, I've got no tolerance when I perceive that something difficult, hard or not fun. Um, and I wanna do my best job. I want to be the best I can possibly be. But then when I get correction or feedback, I can have really big behaviors at the same time. So those are kind of some of the dichotomies that I see in the, the twice exceptional learners that I work with. And I think this visual is just really a, a helpful visual when you're thinking about the strengths and the challenges, right? Uh, twice exceptional learners often have this really rich vocabulary. They're resourceful. They, they think very critically about things, but at the same time, they have a hard time with writing. That is something that I've noticed is, is usually a almost always a challenge. Um, high anxiety, easily frustrated, uh, challenges with organizing, starting, all of those kind of executive functioning type skills, uh, sensitive to criticism, and just uneven, right? Highly amazing in certain areas. And then challenges in areas that you would think would be easy based on those skills that are so um, incredibly sharp. All right, so if we think about kind of some of those overarching skills that we notice in those characteristics, you know, we're really thinking about like high achievement. It's easy to learn. Um, spatial tasks tend to be pretty easy. Um, critical and creative thinking. Oh my gosh, some of the most amazing ideas. I'm like, wow, how did you even get that from that? You started here and you have this, that is incredible. Um, they want to know why, right? They're, they're not going to just sit down to do things to do things because an adult said, let's do it. They want to know why, and they want to know how that connects to things that are important to them and their developing sense of values. Um, some of the twice exceptional learners I've worked with have the best sense of humor, where all of a sudden you just hear this little one-liner and you're like, what was that? You're rolling on the floor laughing with them. They're very opinionated and they're curious. They want to know. So when we think about those strengths, which we really want to program for and support them with uh, to achieve what's important to them, we also think about some of those obstacles, right? Those emotional capacities, that attention, cooperation, impulsivity, shifting those oh one and done rules, right? Something happens and we make a rule and we stick to it. A uh, little bit of rigidity in there, uh, persistence in both the helpful and not helpful zones, right? Persistence is an incredible skill that's very hard to teach. But man, for us adults supporting these twice exceptional learners, sometimes you're like, oh, can I just, can we have one day that's a little bit easy here? Um, low tolerance, unpredictability, and a little bit of resistance to kind of change once we've gotten into a routine. So where do we get a little stuck with these learners? When we're just asking them to demand, we're giving them a demand because we want them to comply. We're giving them an instruction just because. Um, and I am definitely, um, I definitely do this with my own human. I need you, I need you to do this because I said so. Our twice exceptional learners, they want to know the why. They want you to take the time to think about why do you want me to do that? Um, other rigid systems that really focus on forced compliance with little flexibility are very challenging. Um, I kind of think about it in terms of degrees of freedom, like how many different ways can you accomplish the same goal rather than having a linear system? Uh, they tend to think in very creative ways. So allowing that creativity to be part of it, I think is huge. All right, I'm gonna kind of go fast because I, I get on a freight train and I get talking and I want Craig to have some time to talk as well. Um, but support essentials, relationship, 
Relationship is key. Connect often, be genuine, listen. Identify the why, right? Connect to what's important to them. If they don't have that connection, it's very challenging to persist. Give them that big picture. What are we here to do? Heavy intervention around areas of strength, project-based learning. Let them get that hyper-focus and overdrive and run with what's important to them. Um, give them an opportunity to learn from experience rather than just hearing. Um, and demonstrate flexibility yourself, right? It's okay to flex. It's okay to kind of take back what you said. It's all right to, um, to, to say, hey, yeah, you're right. I missed there. Let, let's go back. That's all right to do. Um, modeling that flexibility can be so helpful. Uh, visual and written support. Use technology. If writing isn't their jam, that's okay. We've got so many things to offer. Allow them to use skills flexible, flexibly uh, within the classroom, at home, around all sorts of activities. Spend a lot of time building emotional capacities. I've listed a couple of different approaches here that if people are interested, they can look into the happy medium approach, which is our approach within Eclipse Therapy, supports building psychological flexibility as does DNAV, which is your discoverer, helps you step into new skills, new places, your noticer, put your noticer goggles on, notice kind of what emotions are showing up, um, what body sensations are showing up, and your advisor is your inner thinking, your inner critic, your inner coach, and then your values, right? What, that's your compass. Why do we do what we're doing? All right, and here's just a couple of examples of ways that you might support building some of those emotional capacities. Um, and then I think I'm gonna turn it over to Craig so that we've got enough time and certainly happy to send out this PDF for people to uh, look at, but sharing control with these twice exceptional learners as well as drop the rope. It's okay, you can live to teach another day. You don't have to hold a line you know, no lines in the sand with these twice exceptional learners. It's okay to drop the rope, be flexible and, and say, hey, I made a miss. Um, and then just distress tolerance. But I'm gonna turn it over to Craig so that he's got a chance to talk and then we'd love to, to field your questions. Thank yeah, you, just a reminder really quick, Craig, is um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A section. Please type your questions in and we'll allow for about 10 minutes or so at the end. So. Thank you all. Craig, go ahead, sorry. Thank you, Rosalie. I, I loved your drop the rope concept <laughs> in my podcast, Legit Parenting, I, I talk about, you just have to be this side of good enough. You don't have to be perfect. And in normal times, I'd say, you know, parental consistency is really important for kids, but not tiger mom, 100%. It doesn't work. It's not gonna be helpful to anybody. Like if you got the average neurotypical kid, 80% consistency is great. If you've got kids with uh, exceptionalities, you're shooting for 60, 65%, you're just fine. If you got a preschooler with special issues, 51% is good enough. <laughs> they are tough. So and during COVID, that was even more important to be able to drop the rope a lot. It was a tough time, but really enjoyed it. Now, my side of things in terms of what I do at the office and my, my staff does at the office is really focused on the social and emotional side uh, of exceptional kids, including 2E kids. And we do, we have group therapy, they're mixed with different types of students. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have a, a 2A uh, stepson who's uh, in his forties and then a 2E daughter who's almost 17. So I, I totally understand all the various challenges because I see it at the office and I live it at home. Now, in terms of, oh, let's see, my slide's not moving, Tiffany. We tried it earlier and it worked. Uh-oh. Tiffany, any thoughts? Um, I don't know. Can you click that little arrow down at the bottom, Craig, the one that is on the bottom of your slide? Will that advance it? Oh, let me try that. Oh, thank you very much, Rosalie. You can see how much I know about technology. <laughs> 
even with COVID. Uh, okay, so I like to think about, well, here's your cognitive potential. That's that horizontal line. And obviously for our two e kids, they have an, a, a high capacity for learning, right? So they have great cognitive potential. At the top, you can see some factors, additional factors that can take that even higher. And this is for all students, not, not just the two E kids, but for all kids, there's issues that will take it higher, your performance, good attention skills, good working memory. So the ability to hold things in your head while you're completing them, uh, getting organized, a math problem you're working on, and processing speed. How fast does your brain do that? And so kids that do well in those areas, you'll often see them perform higher than you would expect because they rely on those skills so much. Uh, also in your testing, you probably all have your kids tested. Uh, when you have uh, similar verbal scores compared to your visual, spatial, and nonverbal scores. So if the scales are fairly close, you're gonna see it's a lot easier to work in both sides of the brain or both of those areas at the same time. Now, you can also have then kids who struggle in these areas, and that's going to drive down performance and keeps them from reaching that potential. And Rosalie mentioned several of these things in her presentation, but I thought I'd focus on, again, the big three. So for kids with ADHD, they're struggling with attention, right? They're the, they're the kids that are like squirrel, and they're looking out the window and all over the place, uh, struggling with working memory. They get started on a task. They get the first two steps done and then they can't remember what they were doing. They get distracted or what the next step was. Or when they have uh, low processing speed. I had uh, two students I was thinking about one 20 years ago who was the 99th percentile for mathematics. His processing speed was the second percentile. So here's this genius mathematician who was taken in seventh grade. It took him four hours a night to do his math homework and he was just beaten up by it. He had this wonderful mother who just took the school to task. I won't mention the district, but boy, she went after him. And finally, he got accommodations. He had fewer assignments. And I'm happy to tell you that about five years ago, I got his graduation announcement from college with a math degree, and he was going on to get his PhD in mathematics. So his mom's effort was because of her. She kept him going, and he loved math. Uh, so you're gonna see kids with those splits. I, I see another girl at St. Anne's of Reconcile, really cognitively just brilliant, especially verbally, uh, but is the processing speed is just so difficult that to get things done. Uh, so obviously there, your ADHD kids, specific learning disabilities. I myself, I'm dyslexic. Um, I, I saw a student years ago, the highest IQ I've ever seen, it was estimated to be 172, but it was reading at a second grade level when he was in middle school. Uh, and he obviously, on the emotional side, just felt defeated all the time. It was such a struggle for him. Now, when you have a split on the visual nonverbal scales, and I'll give you specific examples. So if we look at your two each other as really high verbal scores, but maybe lower visual spatial and lower nonverbal scores when there's a split. And usually if it's 20 points or more, you're going to see that interfere. So these kids are going to approach the world in a very verbal, strictly verbal way. Uh, I see a student now, second grader, 99th percent verbal, uh, 60th percent visual, spatial, and nonverbal, which isn't bad. That's pretty good. But he does everything verbally. And, and he had an experience recently where the kid lost two weeks of sleep because some kid at school in second grade was telling him about Momo online, which was one of those internet hoaxes. It was one of the first ones, the scary creature that would dare you to do things. And I was explaining to him about, yeah, that, that's been around a long time. This kid's teasing you. He's having fun with you. He's making this up that Momo doesn't come to the house. He's not coming to your house. And the kid looked at me and he said, so you mean my friend, you mean my friend's lying to me? <laughs> yeah, he's pulling your leg, man. But, but he takes everything just at the word he hears. Um, I, I see a high school kid, young male who very verbal, but struggles with the socializing. And his big goal, the one thing that got him to go see me is he wants to have a girlfriend. I'm like, okay, I can help you with that. I'll teach you how to do that. Uh, another kid who's in college, superior verbal skill. He does have autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and so for him, just getting out and socializing 
at school, work, and he also wants to have a girlfriend, so we're working on those things. Now, on the other side, you can have a child with a high visual spatial nonverbal scales, but struggles in other areas, including a lower verbal score. Uh, my daughter is like 98th percentile visual spatial learner. She loves art. She's as social can, as can be. She's got ADHD. Um, she just chats nonstop at school, really struggles with that. Uh, also has dyscalculia. So you can see where she's gifted in this one area, but then those other areas are so difficult. And I got to tell you, getting homework done over the years has been a major challenge for sure. Hey, Craig, now, I yes. normally don't interrupt in the middle, but somebody did ask, what is you know, visual spatial in the context of school? So, so in the testing thing, well, the easiest way to think about visual spatial is learning where you can observe something and see how it works or how it all fits together. So there tend to be big picture thinkers. And so your hands-on stuff is gonna be good for them. Uh, it's like people who are handy at home when something breaks and they can just go, oh, well, I see this is this, this is this, I can fix it. And other people, you'd have to get a list of instructions and read each line and do each step. So they, they tend to see the big picture and take, uh, and Rosalie's hand out, but the small part, the small dots versus the whole picture, these kids see the whole picture. So they paint these stained glass windows with all the little components. Uh, in the social realm, these are kids who, they read every social cue around them. They read others' emotions. They know what people are thinking and they put it all together. Um, in, in literature, in algebra, that takes a lot of that. Uh, algebra does. Uh, also in language, when you start to go to symbolic learning, um, you know, like what does the road, what does the flower represent in the story? And you'll get kids who write these incredible depictions of the, what the rose means. And you get the kid who writes, it's red, it has thorns. <laughs> and that's about it. Uh, when I was in middle school, we had to read Animal Farm and it was supposed to be about the Soviet Union. And I remember reading that whole book and I never saw the Soviet Union mentioned once. And I couldn't make that leap at that age to what this all meant. Does that make sense, Tiff? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I, I, yeah, it was just crucial in that time. So I want to jump on. We'll wait till the others till the end. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. Uh, now, second slide. So when I meet with kids, so my big thing is how do I explain this to a child? How do I help them understand themselves better? And I, and I draw this ship for them. And I say, okay, we, we want to sail from New York to London. Well, first of all, you, you need to have a pretty big boat. And that's your cognitive capacity, your capacity for learning. And these kids have huge boats, just giant boats. They're gonna make it to London. No, no tornado or, or tsunami or whatever is gonna tip them over. They're gonna make it. But it's often gonna take them longer. So if you look at the, maybe the if it's a motorized boat, the propeller's too small compared to the size of the boat. So it's gonna be slow for the processing speed or the sails are too small for that sailboat. Or working memory forgetting what they're supposed to be doing or what they're even supposed to be taking home for homework. Or they get distracted. So here's our captain and he's looking at the clouds, thinking about SpongeBob, uh, or maybe dyslexic who can't even read what he's supposed to be doing. And, and so rather than a straight line across to London, it's gonna take longer to get there and it's gonna be extra work. So they tend to get distracted and off course and it's constantly this versus that straight line. The good news is they have this incredible capacity for learning, but it is going to take longer and some of these things are going to be harder for them. Uh, on the next slide, on the emotional side, so I'm going to talk about social and emotional issues. Uh, this picture, actually, uh, Tiffany's husband, Kyle, and I put this together for a lecture we did for uh, the ADD Adventure Conference, maybe 10 years ago, I think. But you can see kind of the snowball effect for them. So, you know, let's say the organizational kid, the kid with ADHD. We start out the year with some missing assignments. Now, I would also tell you that every parent I know, you do all this stuff over the summer to get your kid ready for a new year, and you're hoping this year is going to be different. And then in about two weeks, you see some missing assignments. And now the emotions are kicking in. Uh, that word there where it says hopeless, that's supposed to actually see, say hapless with a typo but they're often hapless. I don't know why this is happening. We feel stress, anxiety, we're getting negative feedback. 
in the research, I tell you that uh, when you look at ADHD children in the classroom compared to non-ADHD children, uh, ADHD kids get 10 times the negative feedback in the classroom every day. So when you think about getting 10 times the negative, like you're not on the right page, where's, where's your notebook? Please pay attention, sit still please. 10 times a day, how do you feel about yourself? If, if you were getting your chops busted by your boss 10 times more than everybody else, you're gonna struggle emotionally. And, and then we start to struggle with tests, more incomplete assignments, poor quality grades, poor test results. Now we're starting to feel helpless. I don't know what to do. I'm frustrated. You see risk inhibition, uh, often feeling different or excluded. Um, avoidance, we're, we're avoiding things. And one of my favorite students years ago, who was at St. Anne's and, and we have chapel at St. Anne's once a week, the kids do. And our old priest would ask the kids come to read out of the Bible. And she looked at me one day and she had dyslexia. And she said, I leave my glasses in the classroom in case they ask me to read. And I say, oh, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> like, That's good. I like that one. Uh, and, and the feeling of embarrassment. And the other emotion is that the, that first one, their frustration, the frustration of knowing what you're capable of, but never being able to do it, that you, you can think it, but you can't perform to make it happen. And that is an ongoing, just brutal emotional experience for the kids, that you have this capacity, you know you can do it, but you, you never reach the summit of the mountain. You're strong enough, you're fit enough to make the trail, but you never can get there to the top. Uh, and then the feelings of hopelessness set in. Um, things are always gonna be this way. Uh, you're, you're predicting failure from the very start. Uh, before you even start the new semester or two weeks in the class, you realize, no, it's not gonna work out. Same thing, you struggle with depression and, and feeling alone from others. Uh, I have a high school kid I see right now who's quite gifted, especially musically, but keeping up with homework, he just gets, the snowball just runs him over and he surrenders pretty quick at this point. He's a junior and is learning just to kind of cave in rather quickly. Um, then on the next one, common social struggles. Some of these Rosalie had, if you're ADHD kids, impulsivity, they're often hyper defensive. So they get upset quick when, when they're challenged or deny things or a quick lie when something comes up. Uh, statistically, we know for ADHD kids, 80% of them have severe social skills deficits uh, compared to non-ADHD kids. So the social struggles really overlap with, with attention and that hyper defensiveness or being too aggressive, pushing others to get on the bus uh, are fairly common. Now for our verbal kids, I, I call it verbal diarrhea. They'll just start talking and they keep talking and they keep talking and they don't really realize that nobody's really interested or they've lost uh, interest in what they're saying or, or they may not make the connection to what's going on in the classroom versus what's in their head. I remember a little boy years ago, the class was talking about, could they someday grow plants on the moon? And this boy raised his hand and teacher called on him and he said, well, I was wondering if you could raise broccoli on the bottom of the ocean. Well, all the kids were like, oh, we're talking about the moon, not the ocean. He didn't make the connection for, well, that I'm thinking of the environment, a lack of oxygen. How could you do that there? How could you do it on the moon? It was, I thought it was brilliant, but unfortunately the other kids didn't catch on and he didn't lead them through the process. Uh, Rosalie mentioned too, poor frustration tolerance. That could be with academics, and it also shows up uh, socially, uh, very literal. So the kids with the high verbal scores, just very literal when they're talking, struggling with the symbolisms, uh, very facts and detail uh, based. So they'll often have long list of details they could tell you about what they're interested in. Uh, and they're more than happy to tell you about that. But again, don't pick up on only share two or three things and then let the other person talk. Uh, the rigid and right. They often are very rigid in their thinking and they're going to be right. I had two boys on the way home from a group field trip. Had a great time. We were playing laser tag and they got into an argument over what, whether it was a Colorado buffalo or a bison. And those two argued for 15 minutes about buffalo or bison. And finally they said, guys, we get back to the office, we'll Google it. This was before smartphones. I'm like, we'll Google it. 
And we came back to the office, Googled it, and it said, you can use either one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm like, see, you guys argue for nothing. Uh, they get missing out on the nonverbal cues. That'd be for the kids who struggle with the social cues. Again, more of your verbally based kids. Uh, and often idiosyncratic interest. Um, I had one kid who was, was, he was obsessed with Tiffany glass. And that was his thing he loved. He also loved diamond, cuts of diamonds. Now, how many other kids, boys in fifth grade are into Tiffany glass and diamonds? It's a co really cool interest, but it, it, the, the base of social relationships gets smaller because it's harder to find many kids with your interest that you can try to connect with. Um, now, what I try to get the kids to do is let's try to expand and be a little more flexible with our playground choices to try to try other things instead of just what you're into or invite others into your idiosyncratic interest. Uh, one of the girls I mentioned earlier, she was she had this obstacle course in her head around the campus that she would follow. It was really quite something, but she'd do it alone every day. And I'm like, honey, I, I want you to invite some kids to do it with you. Then, then you have a couple of kids. You've got friends doing this with you. That would be better for you. Uh, I had another student who started a book club uh, at recess. And within two weeks, he had like five or 10 other kids out there reading with him every day instead of just being alone, reading by himself every day. Now, over time, when you put those social and emotional pieces together and the academic struggle, so realms of control. When your child's younger, the parent has all the control. Every year your child gets older, that balance beam is supposed to tip more towards the child, right? And it's supposed to be just this gradual progression. Uh, in psychology, we talk about this sense of self-efficacy, which means I feel confident that I can do things. I can, I can muster the resources to figure out life's problems. I can do it. And you see a real delay in that process for our 2E kids, where the parents are still very much in control over the homework, et cetera, and the child's not there yet. Now, the parents struggle, that I'm sure all of you do, and we, I struggle with this at home too, is how much do you puppy guard them, or when should you just let them fail and learn from experience? Well, if you know anything about kids with ADHD, they often don't learn from experience and they often repeat those failures. So as a parent, you end up then having to kind of accommodate that or do it for them or you puppy guard them. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we've talked at our house about, did you take your medication today? Or we know she has it, right? You can tell right away. And we're still working with, on that, even though it's in a little medic, medication strip right on the breakfast table. I mean, it's there every morning. And somehow we don't notice. It. So that's a, that's a really tough one for parents is how much you puppy guard. What I would tell you, I tell this to all parents in the podcast, parent for independence. You want your kids to be as independent as possible and you want a parent for that. But you don't want them to get you know, too much leash that they get hung on the, on the fence post. Uh, and then just real quick, some general tips. Let me check the time here. I don't have it on my computer. Uh, general tips for development. I really, again, self-understanding. Kids should understand how their brain works. Uh, and that's what I like to explain to kids. And parents need to understand that. Uh, the book is, the, my book is all brain-based. And when kids can understand themselves and you can understand them, it can help take some of the emotionality out of it. So when you're frustrated as a parent, your kid's frustrated, you can say, oh, remember, that's one of those symptoms you have. Well, that's just the way your brain's working. Uh, I have a great series of the podcast about the uh, attention pleasure circuit and dopamine and how that relates to motivation or hyper-focus or how our kids get stuck on gaming, social media, this sort of thing. Uh, appropriate accommodations could be speech to text, fewer math problems. Rosalie mentioned this too, focus on strengths, not the deficits. Put most of your time into what your kid's good at, not so much time filling up the holes. Um, I love Bob Brooks talks about Every kid needs an island of competency. We want to focus on that. Monitor their stress, monitor your stress, and some emotional sharing time. A chance to talk about how are they feeling with all this homework they have. Or that they have homework plus they have to go to tutoring. Like, what do kids want to do after school? They just want to play. They don't want to have to go to tutoring too and do their homework. Um, 
or that emotion that you're not living up to your potential all the time. And here, a lot of times you can't wave a magic wand and change it, but it's just validating what your kids feel. And for parents, what this, what writing great minds is so great at is um, to validate what your experience as parents and you need other parents to understand it because no other parent can fully understand it. Oh, and one thing I forgot on that self-understanding, I wanna give a plug to Kyle, Tiffany's husband, Kyle's results learning. One of the best things my daughter did, we sent her to a week camp or two week camp uh, with results learning and she did it right before middle school. She learned all about her ADHD. She did a PowerPoint presentation, showed it to her middle school teachers. That was the coolest thing ever for her. She really felt empowered. Uh, then finally, embrace the energy, the creativity, and the challenges. You, you really have to. Uh, these kids are a lot of fun. They can, what Rosalie said about comedy, uh, you know, their jokes. Or I had this one ADD kid who, he was always fidgeting. I'm like, you got to put down the fidget toys, man. You, you got to sit still more. And we had apples for a snack pre-COVID, of course, years ago. And I saw him over there working on his apple, and all of a sudden he turned it around. And that kid had carved out the face of an old man in the apple with his teeth. And I'm like, well, that's, you can even fidget with an apple. Okay, you can have fidget toys. It was great. Uh, and finally, keep a long-term perspective. Again, you're parenting for independence. You want to let them explore. I love the story of Bill Gates. Uh, his family took him to therapy when he was middle school. He wasn't doing his homework because he would sneak out at night and go to the University of Washington's computer lab. And they met with a family therapist and the parents wanted Bill to do his school studies. And the therapist looked at him and said, you know, I can help you win this battle, but you're going to lose the war. Let him go to the computer lab. And they did. And that's Bill Gates. Um, and so really think about long term, what's going to be beneficial for him and being able to spell correctly or the perfect handwriting, whatever it is, isn't really going to matter in the long term. Um, and real quickly, I'll just, there's a thing in the, that's the title of the book, a uh, bit about our practice. We do do psych testing, academic testing, social groups, uh, and individual and family therapy. And then that's the podcast. It's just legit parenting. Um, and if you can't remember to spell my name, our website, you can also find it by going to welistentokids.com. Okay, questions? Well, Rosalie, thank are we ready? you so much, Craig. That was wonderful. And, and just to remind everyone, I'm going to be sending out a copy of the recording. I'm going to send out um, Rosalie's document that she did and Craig's as well. So you will be getting oh, both of those along with the recording. So you have all the details and the information. So such good information. Um, be sure to put your questions in the QA section at the bottom. So we do have one. It says, I see good working memory among the two e kids' strengths. Do you find that ADHD slash other neurodivergent causes issues with working memory? My student has lightning speed processing, lightning fast processing speed, but low working memory, which sets up a situation in which teachers are saying, you know how to do this, but the next day she needs reminders while the yep. teacher is perceiving she's refusing to do the work. Rosalie, do you want to touch on that or? Um, sure. I, I see that all the time. The perception, it's so challenging when you have these differing skill levels, right? Like, it's like, you've got this, but wait a second, I don't. I, I tend to kind of lean a little bit on kind of Ross Green's uh, collaborative, you know, problem solving and almost create a little bit of a, almost like a, this is a book about me these are my strengths, right? Like I'm really good at this, but here are things that I'm gonna need some support on. So trying to get the teacher to kind of share, hey, my concerns are, I see you doing this. I see you doing this amazing work. And then having the student be able to advocate and say, but I can do this amazing work, but here's where I need your support to be independent with it. Um, and that might be a list of like, you know, how do I do this? Um, because I, I think it is so easy for us adults to kind of see those strengths and, and just think that everything is super easy and, you know, their superpower. So when we can remind the adult that, that yes, these are superpowers, but I need these supports to be super. It's like my super juice almost. 
Do you have other thoughts, Craig? I, I, yeah, I, that's very much connected with the ADHD. So what I talk in my book and what my students at St. Anne's, we talk about your frontal lobe as your president. It's in charge of the rest of the brain. Now, I also, for our, my 2E kids, I'll talk about, you know, those water and light shows they have, like at Christmas time, you go to the Denver Botanic Gardens and they have music and lights flashing, right? I said, that's your basic kind of brain. Now, when I explained to them the Bellagio water show in Las Vegas, and I said, that's your brain. <laughs> it's like incredible. You got these huge light bulbs going on all over the place. And your poor presence, they're trying to control it all and get you to do one thing at a time and do this or that. And it's hard. And then if they have ADHD, even, so some of the kids will have an average uh, executive functioning, average frontal lobe or president, but they have so much to manage. Then if they also have lower uh, presidential functioning, it's really tough. And there's two areas in that part of the brain. The lower area is impulse control. So that's being able to stop your emotions and then think about it. The upper area, are what, it's what's called the executive functions. And that's attention, organization, working memory, and time management. Uh, processing speed is a completely different thing. That's Processing speed, it can vary by subject. So you can have kids that can be lightning fast at reading, not so much at math, or just your cognitive thinking overall. Some kids will have pretty fast processing speed. Uh, what saved me as a dyslexic was my nonverbal, that visual spatial stuff's really high, so I can see the big pictures. I barely read the book and I can get the concept. And my processing speed's lightning fast. And, and so that made up for the dyslexia piece. That's how I... I just memorized the words over time and could figure things out. But you do very much see with the kids, maybe it's that working memory piece. So they need lists. Uh, it's almost sort of like, you know, the military. They're training you how to clean your gun. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, do it again. Step one, step two. And they train it over and over and over again, these steps. They might need them written down. Uh, I like to encourage, and I do this myself, when I'm visiting with a new someone in a session and I have a thought that I want to bring in a little later, I'll jot it to the side on my paper. And I just write down a couple of words to, to trigger my memory of, oh, I want to bring that up. Now, many times the kids will say, oh, our teacher doesn't allow us to take notes or write things like that. And I, I'll talk to your teacher, look at that set, you can do that. But they need those little reminders to help with that, with the uh, working memory issues. Yes, great points. And the next one from Julia is, is something that I actually wrote down too, because I wanted to couple on this of, you know, you made a very impactful statement, which, you know, I have heard over and over about how many negative comments yeah. our ADHD kids hear over and over. And that's a struggle. Um, so what Julia asked is if a child with ADHD needs constant reminders in life, um, how do we balance that with praise? You know, how do we make sure that we're trying to be thoughtful and considerate, but I know like my son is just like, oh, I don't need these reminders, but I'm like, but you do. So, so great question. Cause I was thinking the same thing. Rosalie. Oh my goodness. This one is so critical. Um, I, I tend to create kind of priority levels of, of areas that are kind of what, what is like critical. And those are, that's the area that I kind of focus on those reminders the most, like Craig was saying about that kind of over and over that repetition, that support, what systems can we put in place to create that autonomy, right? Because we're kind of like their executive functioning, you know, assistant, right? We're like alongside with them to support them. But how do we create systems that allow them to have autonomy so that they don't feel that weight of somebody else sitting on top of them and micromanaging them? So trying to create like three tiers of, of priority, you know, and then how within those tiers do we find some way um, to create autonomy, right? Where maybe it's maybe it's a, a reminder list on their phone that they check in with uh, in the morning, or uh, you know, a whiteboard on their bathroom door. Did you did you put your clothes in the laundry? You know, do you have? Are you dressed? You know, did you brush your teeth? Um, but things that create autonomy so that they can feel confident 
uh, but still have those supports in place because it is, it's a challenge for their brain. It's not a willful, I don't want to do this. It's an, I can't, and I need uh, support in that area. Just like, um, it's interesting that Craig and I are both dyslexic. I barely, I can read, but it's hard for me. And so I, if I can, I will use a, the reader on my phone to read anything to me because if I hear it, I'm great but that's a tool that I've learned to use. So I can, I can have that autonomy. So when you can find those supports, I think it's, it's just incredibly freeing for, for them. Yeah. And I, oh, I'm go sorry. ahead. I will well, I would say, you know, if you start with that idea, of let's understand what specifically is going on for your incredible brain and how all brains are unique. And I always, with my third graders, we look up famous people with ADHD, right? Famous people with dyslexia, right? And, and then you could talk about those, oh, that was that working memory thing, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, that's right. That's hard for you, I know. Uh, or well, that time management, that's so tough for you, isn't it? So you're helping them understand that. And then you can kind of say, as they get older especially, is, hey, would you like me to remind you about this or not? So you ask them that first, so they at least have some autonomy. Same thing when your fourth grader, fifth grader brings up their paper to you to, to review you know, their paragraph, and you're looking at it, and you see like six or eight mistakes, the normal response is you want to get out your pencil. My mother would use a red pen, and you'd circle them, right? And I was like, why do they use red? That's such an offensive color for corrections. But when, instead of that, you, you should say, okay, I, I, I reviewed it. I, I did find three or four things. Do you want me to tell you, or do you want to find them yourself? So you're giving them some autonomy versus just coming at them all the time. And they do feel nagged a lot. Uh, so you might just say, hey, I found those, do you wanna know? Um, the other areas, when your kid has those areas of talent, kids love it when they teach their parents something. All kids love that. Uh, at our group programs, one of the best days for the kids, they love talent day. And all the students, all the children bring in some project or they demonstrate their talent. And they love that when they're, they're in the position of teaching. And that's a real self-confidence building. So again, they do need reminders. You got to do it. You know, if you get wait to get home, if you pick them up from school and you wait to get home to check if they have their assignment and it's 30 minutes away, you're hosed. But what you do is when they come out to the car, you first talk to them about, well, what their favorite thing. So like my son, it was, uh, he loved the avalanche. So tonight I'd be, today I'd be, if he was younger, he's 28 now. If I was picking up, I'd be like, hey, did you see the avalanche games on seven tonight? Can't wait to watch it with them. Oh, now before we go, let's check your backpack for the assignments. So throw in something first. The worst thing a parent can say to their kids when they, when they see them after school right away, how much homework do you have? <laughs> that's a buzzkill. Start with something else that's not related to schoolwork. Yeah. Tiffany? Yes, thank you. There, I know we're at the top of the hour. I see one more question. So I'm going to go ahead and read that up. Um, how focused on social skills, i.e. playing cooperatively or friend making, should we be nudging towards? Our kiddo has very little interest in same age peers. My guess is that may be a common for 2 week kids. I'm unsure if it is something we should be working on or just let it go and allow relationships to come as they evolve naturally. Ooh, that's a tough one. I, 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 oh, go ahead, Rizzo. Oh, no, go ahead, Greg. I'd say, you know, your, your kid is who they are. So you do have to accept that. We do want some social contact. We don't want total isolation. Now, many of the kids who are 2E, often they'll be really into the fantasy play, uh, especially in kindergarten. All the kids, kindergarten, first graders, are all into that fantasy play. Or, you know, they're playing some tag game and somebody's the cat, somebody's the dog and all these, you know, story games that they play. As they get older, you tend to find there's fewer kids playing those games and more doing sports or kind of purpose driven activities on the playground and not so much the free play fantasy stuff. So you help them find out well, which kids like the fantasy play. Let's play with them on, you know, I might tell them what play with them on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And how about Tuesdays and Thursdays, you go to the playground set and play groundies with the other kids uh, and join in with them on the playground. But then on those other days, you could do that fantasy play. 
or you could read your book Tuesday and Thursday, but I want you to try to socialize a little bit more or get somebody to read with you on the other days. So you do have to accept where they are. I had, I was concerned about my, my son, uh, who's in incredible shape. We were scuba diving in ice and he's hiked a ton of 14ers. Um, when he was younger, he didn't want to do anything with organized sports. And I asked the PE teacher once, I said, should I be worried about that? And she said, well, are you sort of fit yourself? And I'm like, yeah. She said, well, did you like organized sports? And I was like, no, I was terrible at it. She said, he'll be fine. And he is. <laughs> he never played. He did one season of lacrosse. That was it. Um, so you got to let them be who they are. But also we want to try to, to join a little bit more. The other thing I would tell you, if you have a child with nonverbal learning disability, autism spectrum, and even for the ADHD kids, when you're trying to get them to do, quote, more neurotypical activities, it is very tiring for them. It's very fatiguing. And they need then afterwards to have some of their me time alone, usually on the computer, to just get to their baseline of comfort before they try another social activity. So you, you really have to balance that out for them. Um, okay, we're going to have a little more social time now, but then you can have some time on, alone on the computer when we get home. Right. Yeah. Did you want to add some? Oh, go ahead, Rosalie. Oh, I just, I really love that. It's so critical to let, let kids be who they are, even if yeah. it isn't exactly what we, we are expecting. Um, you know, and, and I, I love that DNA V that discoverer character, right? You got to step out and try something new every once in a while. Cause you don't know if you're going to like it or if you don't like it. Um, so taking a little discovery time, but then recognizing just how many emotions show up during those discovery moments, like, like Craig was saying, give them time to be themselves after and get back to homeostasis. Cause it's hard. It'd be like yeah. me going out and running a marathon. I would need a recovery time after that. Well, thank you both so much um, for all you do, your commitment to our children, to the parents, just helping us navigate um, this crazy journey. And I think, you know, the biggest thing is, is that you guys have mentioned too, is just loving our children for who they are, uh, prioritizing, you know, some of those key aspects that we want to find and hone in on and give ourselves grace. Um, I think the biggest relief for me too has been letting go of other people's expectations and how they should be and, yeah. and loving my child wholeheartedly. If he doesn't want to sit at the day with dinner table and is running around, he's going to eat when he's hungry and allow and pick and prioritize those things because it does stick in my mind how many times everywhere they go, the negative constant correction that's happening and how we can provide that support and love. So thank you all for joining us today. Craig, Rosalie, I appreciate you guys. Um, you, please check out our website and, and join with these amazing providers and professionals that can help you. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you. You all, all right. have a Bless wonderful it. day. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye.